Welcome to Social Studies with Mr. Regis. Today we're moving into, well, a fairly dark topic. This is not something that is fun to talk about. It's essentially the worst of humanity. So we're looking at genocides today. Now, what's the definition of genocide? It's the deliberate killing of a large group of people, especially those of particular group, nation, or ethnicity. You should be familiar with the terms here, and you should be familiar with some of the concepts of like us versus them. Well, why are genocides committed? Essentially, it all boils down to the results of ultranationalism. Now, this is quite a specialized term, but it's led to mass killings. So in the last hundred so years, there have been many different genocides with massive death tolls. Now, these are approximations because when genocides are occurred, they try not to give exact details about how many people they are killing. Yet we see that they haven't been stopped. And so how do we know when a genocide will occur? There's 10 stages that we're going to look at that take place before and during a genocide. Now, before we get into this, let's talk a little bit more about some context here. Well, the term genocide didn't even exist before 1944. It comes from a combination of the Greek word genos with the Latin word sitio. Now, genos means family, tribe, or race, and sitio means to massacre. So genocide is an extremely specific term referring to violent crimes committed against groups with the intent to destroy them. And so that intent of destroying an entire group is part of the definition. So why are they committed? Well, we mentioned it's a result of ultranationalism. So what is this? Well, this is that concept of the nation to the extreme. So where do you fit in? Like, people, if you do not fit into a nation, well, then where do you go? What if you live in that nation? Well, here, you'd be eradicated. A little bit, though, that's worthwhile mentioning before we get into the stages of genocide is that genocide does not exist in a vacuum. It is a process. And this is why we have these 10 different stages. And so whether it's the actual killing of large numbers of people or the less violent destruction of their culture, normally genocide is carried out by governments. Now, you could think about this, like how could an entire group of people be targeted if it was done by any group other than the government? What would happen if a bunch of people decided it was time to kill a group of people in Canada? Would the government stop them? Our answer should be yes. And so in order for something like this to happen, well, we're seeing it from the top down. And so how can people still belong to groups that take part in such horrible acts? You know, we're going to be looking into these things. Genocides are often justified as being in the national interest. So societies that are most open to genocide have at least one significant minority group that's somewhat disadvantaged compared to the majority. And one group usually blames the other group for their misfortunes. And so there's a saying that says, beware the demagogue. What's the demagogue? Well, this is someone who feeds off stereotypes, prejudices, etc. It's quite prevalent in populism politics where people get riled up emotionally and the problems that they are uh, experiencing are the cause or are caused by, you know, specific groups. Now the 10 stages of genocide were first outlined by Dr. Greg Stanton. He was the department of state 1996. And these 10 stages make a clear connection between ultranationalism and genocide. One thing, though, that is important to remember, genocide can be stopped at any of the following stages. 
This is extremely important to remember. Many people, when we're discussing World War II, you look at it and people say, oh, everybody was doing it. What would you have done? Gotten yourself killed? But you have to ask yourself, at what point does standing by and doing nothing make you an accomplice? Or when does that accomplish anything? If everyone is standing by in the face of horror and brutal acts, the acts continue. It does take individuals to step up and do something to make a difference. And that is extremely important here. So the first category, the first stage of genocide, this is classification. While all cultures use categories to distinguish people into us and them, this is based on things like ethnicity, race, religion, nationality, and genocide is more likely to exist in societies that lack mixed categories or places where multiculturalism is not practiced because it's easier to say them and us, right, to draw that line. So the way to avoid these tensions from escalating into genocide is to have groups and institutions that promote tolerance and acceptance. And so these groups are not present in nations who have suffered from genocide. And so this us versus them mentality, it creates the feeling that people need to be protected against the other. And so you're distinguished by these different factors. And some societies that we could say are maybe bipolar, like Rwanda, are most likely to have genocides because there's no way for classifications to fade away through intermarriage. Now, if we think back to some of our other lessons, we've talked about things like internment or old racism in Canada. We've seen a change to the promotion of acceptance, and this can get rid of that classification system. But Canada itself has a large history of classifying, right? This is evident in things like our segregationist policies, suffrage, so the right to vote, and other things. So, But internment's a good example from us talking about World War I and World War II. That was extremely based on ethnicity or race. So classification examples, right? Because we need to be able to identify each stage for us to understand it. You might be able to also identify modern examples of this that are going on recently. I should also just mention, we're going to be using the Holocaust. So Germany, German alternationalism, and the Rwandan genocide as our two main case studies here. Very different time periods, 1940s and 1994. So there's a big gap in the time, and yet they follow the same stage as a genocide. So Germany, Nazis, uh, start categorizing people by categories. We have the Aryan race and others. So Aryans are placed above everyone else. If you didn't match the physical, religious, or ethnic traits, you were declared subhuman. And Jewish people were identified as descendants of non-European races. So we start to see that classification of different groups. Now you might remember from the World War II lecture, the concept of this Aryan was so influential that the story is the Shah of Persia changed the name of the country to Iran because he was so enamored with Hitler's discussions about the Aryan race. Rwanda. Well, this is something we can see as a result of colonization. Belgian colonists begin the division between Hutus and Tutsis early on in colonization. The Belgians declared that the Tutsis were superior to the Hutus, so they start to make those classifications. But when the Europeans leave with decolonization, the Hutus being the majority are in charge, and they are angry about years of oppression. Here's some examples of how classification looks. So. Aryans, now this doesn't mean blonde hair, blue eyes necessarily, but it's that belief in that pure European descent. And so the belief was that it was a higher racial stock. And again, Jewish people did not belong to this, according to the Nazi party. So here's an example of anti-Jewish propaganda in Nazi Germany. In Rwanda... Well, we have the classification of 
are different tribes here. The main ones in Rwanda were the Tutsi and the Hutu, and there were also some others such as the Twa. Now, Belgian colonists believed that Tutsis were a naturally superior nobility. They even thought that they descended from the Israelite tribe of Ham, so there was that religious basis here as well. And so the Rwandan royalty at the time was Tutsi. Belgians distinguished Tutsis and Hutus through things like nose measurements or eyes and height. Or even that Hutu farmers or Hutus were farmers and Tutsis were more often pastoralists. These are some of the ways that classification existed here. Now, as you can see in this picture, that measuring of things like noses, in the 1800s and even in some of the 1900s, there was a practice used quite a bit to help entrench racist policies. And so it's based on pseudoscience, so not actual science. It's fake. But what we, one of the, well, some of the methods, they called it phrenology. So studying things like cranium sizes, and they use these fake scientific methods to try to classify people into lower positions. This helps justify things like segregationist policies or slavery. Our second stage, this is symbolism. Once a group has been classified as subhuman, the next step is to assign them a symbol that publicly shows their status. If you don't have a symbol, how do we know what you've been classified as? And this step doesn't automatically lead to genocide. It depends on if it progresses to stage three. So some of the symbolism we see are, well, in Germany, Jewish people had to war or had to wear yellow stars. There were also different names that were used, so Jew and German, and then also types of dress, Nazi swastika armbands. And in Rwanda, the Tutsis were given identification cards so you could show that you were a Tutsi, you know, you belong to that group. Now, if you were asked then by somebody in authority, like a police officer to show identification, they would know right away which group you were classified onto. Here's an example of some of the yellow stars or a Tutsi identification card. One thing though that's important to talk about here is that, or I guess, first off, ethnicity was first noted on cards by Belgian colonial authorities in 1933. And Tutsis were given access to limited education programs, Catholic priesthood, while Hutus were given less assistance by colonial authorities. But at independence in Rwanda, these were reversed. Now, as we're talking about classification and symbolism here, it's worth mentioning that race is not a thing. Race does not exist. Race is a social construct. Yes, there are different ethnicities and people come from different areas. However, there is no such scientific thing as race. Race was a socially created concept to create a power relationship and label. And so when we talk about race and racism, there's no scientific basis to it. However, because the concept of race has been used in power relationships, it still is a real thing because of the experience. These ID cards we see here being used, this was used to distinguish Hutus from Tutsis in the 1994 massacres of Tutsis and moderate Hutus that resulted in over 800,000 deaths. Jewish people were also carried something called a rise pass or a passport. So all Jewish people had to carry it by 1938. <clears throat> Here's some other symbols that were used. This is especially something you would see in the different prisons. So Germans classified all sorts of different people. And you'll notice here things like homosexuals. They were classified in the same category as sex offenders. And the symbol to distinguish them was a pink triangle. These are some of the different uses of symbolism. Stage three. This is discrimination. Here we see the dominant group beginning to create laws and use political power to deny the right of the non-dominant group. 
So we can think of laws being used here to restrict people from doing things. Canada itself has had many discriminatory laws in the past. So we do not get to say, oh, we're different, right? We have this history as well, played out differently. So in Germany, one of the things that was created was called the Nuremberg Laws. This was in 1935. Stripped Jewish people of their German citizenship, made it illegal for anyone to employ them, and it also made it illegal for them to go to universities. So there's a newspaper clipping here showing the world reaction to this, and that's actually worth mentioning for a second. Most of these genocides that occur, the Holocaust being one of them, the world knew what was going on. The world watched each stage of genocide happening. It was not like Germany had a big wall surrounding it and nobody knew what was going on. This was known by every country in the world that Germany was doing these things, yet they didn't do anything. You also see here an image with the Nuremberg Laws of who you were allowed to marry. Essentially, depending on how much German or Jewish ancestry you had, that dictated who you could or could not marry. So they tried to restrict Jewish people from spreading into the rest of the population. Stage four, dehumanization. This is a stage that I personally recognized quite a bit in the last several years by politicians. It's a very scary stage. What happens here is members of the non-dominant group begin to be referred to as animals. So some of the terms you might hear are rats, insects, or different diseases. And so radio stations, newspapers, propaganda, they all begin spreading these terms across the nation. So in Germany, the Jews were referred to as rats and vermin. In Rwanda, in Rwanda the Hutus began referring to the Tutsis as vermin and more famously, cockroaches. This was spread across all government radio stations. So why do we dehumanize somebody? Well, just like the term says, you move somebody from being a human, somebody like you, to a lower status. If you see a cockroach run across your kitchen floor, what are you going to want to do to it? Step on it and kill it. So by dehumanizing individuals, it makes it easier to believe that they are not like you that us versus them, because they're lesser than human, well, we're obligated to get rid of them. Again, this sort of speech is prevalent in some politicians today. Here's some images showing different ways of dehumanizing. So what you're seeing here is, you know, a group denying the humanity of another group, making them seem subhuman. And what dehumanization does is it overcomes the normal human revulsion against murder. And so hate propaganda is being spread. And who controls the propaganda? Oftentimes it's the government. And so messages like kill the cockroaches. And if this disease is not treated immediately, it will destroy all the Hutu. These are some of the messages that were spread by the radio and television in Rwanda. This dehumanization, again, it invokes superiority of one group and inferiority of another. It also justifies murder by calling it ethnic cleansing or purification. Such euphemisms hide the horror of mass murder. And I want to bring in the personal implication here again. The reason we're already at stage four is because the individuals in society are not doing anything about it. This is where you actually have obligations and responsibilities. If you hear somebody dehumanize another group of people, maybe that's through a racist joke. Maybe it's because, oh, I don't want this group to immigrate to my country because they're so-and-so. If you stand by and do nothing, you are allowing these stages to continue. That doesn't mean that you hearing a racist joke is going to lead to genocide. But the point is, these things are occurring and these stages progress because the people are not doing anything. It does not go from day one, there's nothing happening. Day two, millions of people are getting killed. These stages progress and the people are helping it progress. 
if we place all the blame on a leader like, let's say, Hitler, we say, oh, Hitler was evil, and that's why these things happened. Well, Hitler didn't do any of the killing. It was the people. We have to start invoking responsibility here so that we actually know how to respond when these things are happening today. The next stage is organization. Genocides can't occur without a lot of planning. If you are going to kill 100,000 people in a week, this is not an easy thing to do. So in most cases, it's going to be the act of a government, military, or radical extremist group who has the money, power, and resources that are needed to commit the genocide. Things like killing squads, death camps, internment camps, military groups, etc. They have to be trained and well-managed in order for a genocide to be successful. So Germany and Rwanda both had government military support to carry out their genocides. Hitler used the SS to kill off the Jewish people and other groups. Rwanda used government-supported militia groups. Some of them were called the Interhamwe. Again, genocide is a group crime, so it has to be organized. The state is usually the one that's doing the organizing here. They're financially supporting groups. It takes money to organize, and so the government provides it. And plans are made by elites for this final solution of genocidal killings. I mentioned that the Hutu groups that did this, some of them were called interhamwe. This means those who stand together. And they said Hutu power. So there was elites that armed youth militias to do the killing. Government and Hutu power businessmen provided the militias with over 500,000 machetes and other arms and set up camps to train them to protect their villages. This leads to stage six, polarization. Polarization is when that distinct divide between us and them occurs. So extremists begin broadcasting polarizing media and propaganda. You see things like intermarriage between groups being banned. And members of the extremist group who oppose this treatment are usually the ones who stop the genocide from progressing. Because of this, though, they're also normally the first ones who are killed. And so, I've mentioned that personal implication, it can be dangerous. And so, when a government is ramping up or amping up their measures to get closer to a genocide, they want to get rid of those moderates, the people who are going to try to stop it. You might notice also that some of these stages are familiar, and that makes sense. So sometimes it can be hard to distinguish exactly what stage you're in, but it is a progression. So polarization during the Holocaust. Jews start being moved from their homes into ghettos. Now, these were essentially segregated areas in a city and you're organizing where people are living. You can classify them. Oh, if you live in that ghetto, you belong to this group of people. It also makes it easier to get those people later. And so Hitler and the Nazis were blaming the Jewish people for the problems that Germany faced in the interwar period. They were using them as a scapegoat. Hitler associated Jews with the devil. He said the personification of the devil as the symbol of all evil assumes the living shape of the Jew. Now, this is extreme language being used here. And things like the passing of the Nuremberg Laws just increases the polarization. In Rwanda, we start seeing that anti-Tutsi ads being passed. Uh, one of the newspapers, the Kangura newspaper, was controlled by Hutu extremists. In one article, it called for all Hutus to stop all business or personal relationships with any Tutsi. They labeled the Tutsis as cockroaches or enemies. You can see some of this in the imagery in that newspaper here. And if you dealt, if you were a Hutu and you dealt with the Tutsis, you were considered a traitor. So you're becoming more and more polarized. Extremists are driving groups apart. Hate groups are broadcasting and printing propaganda. Laws are passed forbidding intermarriage or social interaction. And political moderates are being silenced or killed. There were even public demonstrations organized against Jewish merchants in Germany. 
And the moderate Germans, the dissenters, they were the first to be arrested and sent to concentration camps. You also might see here attacks being staged and blamed on targeted groups. In Germany, the Reichstag was burnt down and Hitler blamed Jewish communists in 1933. And so then you might see cultural centers of targeted groups being attacked. In 1938, an event that's called Kristallnacht, hundreds of synagogues were burnt down. So this is all part of that polarization. Next is the preparation. This is where leaders of extremist groups begin planning for the actual killing. Leaders refer to genocide as ethnic cleansing or purification or counter-terrorism. This is done to justify, justify what they're about to do. Cleansing has a positive connotation to it. Yet today we know what ethnic cleansing really means. We start seeing here things like armies, weapons, death camps, all being constructed. And so extremists will begin to create fear that the discriminated group is going to rise up or kill them. By doing this, you can gain more support. You also might see here floods of refugees starting to flee the country so that they do not get killed. Preparation in the Holocaust. So this is where Hitler started planning for his final solution. This was the codename for the killing of all Jewish people in German-occupied Europe. July 31st, 1941. German SS leaders met to plan for the mass killing. So killing squads, death camps, gas chambers, these are all built. You also have railways being constructed to transport Jewish people to the death camps. Again, with the prepara preparation and organization, putting Jewish people in ghettos made it so that you could just pull the train right up to it, load people on, and the next stop was one of the killing camps. So that's all part of that organization. Preparation in Rwanda. April 7th, 1990, Hutus begin the formal preparation for the genocide. So Tutsi leaders are purged from the government. Hutu extremists also begin expelling UN peacekeepers. Hutus then create an anti-Tutsi youth movement to set up roadblocks around the capital city to prevent the Tutsi from fleeing. That should say April 7th, 1994. My apologies there. Number eight, persecution. Death lists are drawn up. In state-sponsored genocide, members of victim groups may be forced to wear identifying symbols. So people are deliberately deprived of resources such as water or food in order to slowly destroy them. Pogroms are implemented to prevent procreation, or programs are implemented to prevent procreation through forced sterilization or abortions. So not only are you killing people, but you're stopping their capacity to create more of their group. Sterilization is something that was actually done in Alberta up until the 70s. Many of the women's suffragists of the famous five were pro-sterilization. The victim group's basic human rights are becoming abused. So you have extrajudicial killings, torture, forced displacement, and you do start seeing genocidal massacres begin here. And again, they're acts of genocide because they intentionally destroy part of a group. Perpetrators watch for whether such massacres meet any international reaction. If they don't, they realize that the international community will again be bystanders and permit another genocide. Think back to, to that list of genocides. If we look at the Armenian genocide in World War I leading up to today, the Rohingya people in Myanmar, why isn't in the international community doing something, right? In World War II, while the final solution was being enacted, Americans actually knew that the railways, what they were being used for, there was once a plan for the American Air Force to bomb railways so that they could prevent Jewish people from being transported to the killing camps. The U.S. government called that off. They said, you know what, let's not. And so sometimes the international community just watches. And then stage nine, extermination. So this quickly becomes the mass killing legally called genocide, and it's extermination to the killers 
because they don't believe their victims to be fully human. Sponsored by the state, armed forces often work with militias to do the killing. Destruction of cultural and religious property is employed to completely annihilate the group's existence from history. So we see here it results in widespread war crimes. Mass rapes of women and girls have become a characteristic of all modern genocides. Men of fighting age are murdered. Total genocides, all members of the targeted group are exterminated. Now we're going to look at case studies and we'll get into this in more detail. In the Holocaust, they used gas chambers, killing squads. In Rwanda, the tool of choice was machete. This leads us to the final stage of genocide, and this is denial. This lasts throughout and always follows genocides. It's among the surest indicators of further genocidal massacres. What's happening here is perpetrators they dig up mass graves, burn the bodies, try to cover up the evidence, intimidate witnesses, deny that any crimes are committed, or they blame what happened on the victims. The reason a government would deny something was that if you admitted to doing a genocide or enacting a genocide, you're admitting to breaking the law. Like Genocides are illegal. And so you would be admitting your wrongs and you would be saying that the international community is obligated to do something. That's why we see denial happening here. Some of the different techniques used. Denying that there's any mass killing at all. Question and questioning and minimizing the statistics. So saying, I think you have your numbers wrong. Blocking access to archives or witnesses. Or even destroying the evidence. So intimidating and killing eyewitnesses or burning the bodies in archives. Interesting when it comes to evidence. World War II, technology had improved drastically from World War I. The Germans had a lot of really good technology. But one of the things they did was they recorded almost everything they did during the Holocaust, especially in some of the concentration camps like Auschwitz, Birkenau. So they filmed, they took pictures, they had records. There were rooms upon rooms of evidence. And so when the concentration camps were about to be liberated, the Germans tried to destroy as much of this evidence as they could. However, they had created so much evidence against themselves that there's a lot of records of this. Another technique is attacking the truth tellers. So attacking the motives of those who say a genocide has occurred. Now the point of these atrocities, or the point of the atrocities of the truth tellers attempting to make them morally disqualified to accuse anyone of genocide. So they're saying you did something too, so you can't, you can't talk. Denying any genocidal intent at all. So you might, say that the deaths, you might say that the deaths that occurred were because of something like an accident. So famine, migration, or disease. We see things like famine being used in the Holodomor in the Ukraine. Or blaming forces out of your control for the killing. Potentially, you know, ancient conflicts. Or blaming the victims, you know, their strangeness. They're not like us. They're savages, infidels. Another tool that's used often, and this one's extremely important when you're looking at international politics, is calling the event a civil war, right? If you call something a civil war, what you're doing is you're essentially saying there's another group that's partaking in this, you're defending yourself, and you're also suffering huge losses in that war. This gets used a lot as a tool. Those are our different stages of genocide. Again, we're going to look at different case studies specifically, but it's important to look at these different stages. Again, there is an individual obligation and responsibility for these things. Holoc or genocides do not occur in a day. They occur because people are going along with these things. People are spreading this propaganda. People are dehumanizing, symbolizing. And so it 
ultimately rests on the individuals in society of whether or not something like this will happen. Thank you for listening.